Hello and welcome to the final day of the IHTA seminar, Town and Country Perspectives from the Irish Historic Towns Atlas. For those of you who are joining for the first time, I am Sarah Geerty, Cartographic and Managing Editor with the Irish Historic Towns Atlas, which is a research project of the Royal Irish Academy Dublin. So this seminar has been running through May with papers under the theme of Town and Country. It has been chronological and we have already had monastic tenants, Viking raiders and Hiberno Norse townspeople with Howard Clark and Ruth Johnson. That was the first week. Then we had town and country in later medieval Ireland with Michael Potterton, Jim Galloway and Margaret Murphy. And then last week we had lawyers, merchants and peasants, town and country interaction in early modern Ireland with Raymond Gillespie and Brendan Scott. This lunchtime, we enter the 19th century and the city and suburbs of Dublin, from outlying villages to townships. It is based on work in progress on the Irish Historic Towns Atlas Dublin Suburb series, which is supported by Dublin City Council. And our four speakers, Colm Lennon, Seamus Omacho, Frank Cullen and Ruth McManus, are all active contributors to that series. Later this evening at 7 p.m., we hold our plenary session online and look forward to introducing our esteemed colleague, Professor Chris Dyer, who will speak about medieval towns, why we need to take account of the country. If you've registered for this, you will re receive a link for that. So please do join us this evening also. And also, I should say welcome to those of you who are watching this later on, because this will be uh, this link will be provided to watch back later. I've mentioned before that there will be a publication emanating from today and from the whole seminar, also entitled Town and Country, to be published by the Royal Irish Academy and edited by Michael Potterton and myself. I, I'd like to mention today that that book will be dedicated to the cartographic historian John Andrews, formerly of the Department of Geography, Trinity College, Dublin, and one of the founding editors of the Atlas programme. And a section of the book will be dedicated to John's work, and will include Arnold Horner's tribute to John that took place online in November and it's still available to view via our website ihda.ie. We remember John most particularly today, the 27th of May and his birthday, and our topic Dublin and its suburbs is fortuitously appropriate as John's own fish grift published in 1992 and edited by Fred Allen and Kevin Whelan was similarly themed Dublin city and county from prehistory to present. We will begin our session today with Professor Colm Lennon, who is the general editor of the Suburb series and was author of the first to appear, Clontarf, published in 2017. Professor Lennon taught for many years in the Department of History, Maynooth University. He is a member of the Royal Irish Academy and he has published extensively on Irish urban, social and cultural history. And indeed, in addition to Clontarf, he was author of the IHTA publications Dublin Part 2, 1610 to 1756, and co-author with John Montague of John Rogue's Dublin, A Guide to the Georgian City. We are delighted to have Colm with us today and he will set the scene. After Colm, we will take ourselves to Rathmines, where author Dr Seamus Omachu will introduce us to that village, township and well-loved Southside suburb which I can report is currently at proof stage and is due for publication this autumn. Seamus was a secondary school teacher in Dublin City and has more recently lectured in Maynooth, UCD and St. Patrick's College, Drumcondra. He is editor of the Dublin Historical Record and his research and publications on Dublin and its suburban towns is known to anyone interested in the field. From Rathmines, we will move westwards where Dr. Frank Cullen will speak about Kilmainham in Chicor. Frank works with us in the Irish Historic Towns Atlas project in the Royal Irish Academy. And as well as his research on Kilmainham in Chicor, he was author of Dublin 1847, City of the Ordnance Survey, which was published in 2015. And finally, to the north side, there Dr. Ruth McManus will bring us to Drumcondra. Bruce is Associate Professor of Geography at the School of History and Geography, Dublin City University, a newly appointed honorary editor to the Irish Historic Towns Atlas Board. She is widely published in the field of urban geography and suburban history and is currently working on the Drumcondra Atlas for the IHTA. Now, before I have the pleasure of finally handing over to Colm some of the practicalities, 
uh, as audience members, your cameras are off and mics are muted, but please do get involved with us by using the webinar's interactive features. You can submit questions to the four speakers at any stage, and we encourage you to do this during their presentations as they occur to you. You do this by using the Q&A facility in the control panel. At the end of the presentations, questions will have been published and the speakers will address as many as they can. We may go over time, but as I've mentioned, this recording will be available afterwards if you have to leave at uh, too sharp. Our producer is Jennifer Moore and our IT specialist is Alan Jacob, both with us today. If you would like to tweet about the event, the hashtag is hashtag IHTA2021. And now may I invite you to sit back, enjoy the presentations and perhaps consider the commonalities and diversities of these evolving suburban landscapes. Professor Colm Lennon. Thank you. As we've heard already in these sessions, suburbs, including Irish towns, were a feature of the immediate vicinity of Irish cities and towns, such as Limerick, Kilkenny and Dublin from the late Middle Ages. But outlying villages of Dublin, as illustrated here in Roke's 1760 map of County Dublin, remained subsidiary to urban centres, mainly as suppliers of food, fuel and labour. It was only in the 19th century that many of these villages on the periphery of the capital began to be urbanised, resulting from the migration of large populations into the rural hinterland, driven by political, social and economic factors. The context for this afternoon's presentation is in the Dublin series, uh, suburb series of the Irish Historic Towns Atlas, in which a number of townships and suburbs within the area that comprised the county of Dublin, now administered by four separate local authorities, are the subject of atlases organised along IHTA lines. The speakers who are authors of the forthcoming volumes on Rathmines, Kilmainham and Inchicor, and Romcondra will discuss the distinctive topographical identity of their suburb and explore the dynamic between city and district insofar as this has shaped the passion of settlement in the 19th century. In the printed volumes, as seen in Clontarf, the growth of suburbs will be examined through the proven atlas combination of maps and texts, including gazetteers of topographical information and the delineation of localities. Seamus, Frank and Ruth will describe the character of their areas, revealing both the commonalities and the diversities in the evolving suburban landscapes. The essentially rural nature of the urban vicinity was transformed as each suburb evolved at its own pace and in its own style, depending, for example, on the development of the infrastructure of roads and utilities, the establishment of institutions of religion, defence, administration, health and education, and the attraction of a preponderance of differing social groups, whether upper middle class professionals, artisanal classes, or lower middle class clerical and civil servants. As the city thus encroached upon its hinterland, several communities of older inhabitants and newcomers responded in the Victorian period by the formation of townships as in the case of the suburbs under review here. These suburban townships were local authorities, autonomous of Dublin Corporation, that acquired devolved powers of local taxation and administration, and their memberships comprised estate owning, professional and business interests, including developers. Primarily agents of change through the promotion of development and the provision of services, the townships could also be used to retard development regarded as detrimental to the quality of village life enjoyed by the residents, whether maritime or inland. Before the absorption of the townships within the municipality of Dublin in the 20th century, 
are reciprocating those strained relationship between the city and the expanding localities sought to mediate new forms of urban living and to strike a balance between the interests of the suburbanites on the one hand and the C Civic Corporation and Port of Dublin on the other. Proposals for changes to city limits arose out of administrative, fiscal and political frustrations on the part of Dublin Corporation. But topography played a part in the forging of new identities at local level, with suburban districts often cross-cutting older boundaries, including those of manor, parish, townland and estate. In the resetting of the relationship between the city and county, localities came to arrangements with the wider urban milieu, accommodating new transport systems, for example, as seen here, while remaining protective of undeveloped lands in order to prevent working class housing and preserving leisure amenities from the ravages of excursionists. Correspondingly, aspects of the history of Dublin city in the late 19th century may also be elucidated through the perspective of suburbs aspiring to preserve an ambience of Rus in Urbe in the face of the expansion of the metropolitan borders, while sharing in the responsibility for major urban policies in public health, housing and sanitation. Thank you. And I'll hand over now to Seamus O'Matthew. It may come as a surprise to learn that the apparent waterless topography of rat mines today was shaped by the presence of a number of water courses. For those a little more knowledgeable, the name of one of the most prominent features of modern rat mines, the Swan Shopping Centre, may provide a clue. It is called after the Swan River which played a large part in the layout of rat mines today. A second river brings us to the original area known as rat mines, the environments of a rath or ring fort, which became known as Mines Rath, close to the northern bank of the river Dodder. This was one of a series of ring forts strung out on high ground overlooking the Dodder Valley in this part of South Dublin and included Baggett's Rath, Rathfarnham and Rathgar. Sometime between 1279 and 1284, the Rath came into the possession of the De Mines family, who gave it its name. An early modern castle known as Rathmines Castle, built near the Ringforth in the 1630s by Sir George Radcliffe, a state official, probably contained elements of a medieval castle erected by the De Moines family. There is a depiction of old Rathmines Castle. There was a later one from the Gentleman's Magazine, 1789. And you can see on the right there probably what is the remains of a medieval tower. From the Dother, the centre of gravity of rat mines takes two leaps, as it were, northwards. By the late 18th century, early 19th century, a small village had developed at a sharp bend, bend where the Swan River turns north from its eastward course. You can see that on this uh, map showing um, medieval and early modern rat mines. And at the bottom, we have beside the old rat mines castle, the medieval and early modern rat mines. And then further to the north, you can see where the Swan River depicted there in blue. That's the clearly in blue is the Swan and its various tributaries. You can see where an early 19th century village grew up. Uh, two roadways diverged here, one a continuation southwards 
of Rathmines Road, uh, which was headed towards Rathmines Castle, and the other followed the bend of the river and became Rathgar Road. This small riverside village and junction, which became known as the Chains, saw built opposite to it the first of the area's distinctive suburban terraces. Rathmines Road Lower continued towards the city along the east side of the main branch of the Swan River, as you can see there. Another change in the course of the river was followed by a path which became Richmond Hill. You can see that in green there. Um, this became Richmond Hill and also a tributary of the Swan was followed by another path which became the ancient but now largely defunct Blackberry Lane off Rathmines Road Lower. So we can see how the various water courses, the Dother and the Swan and its various tributaries, very much shaped the topography and layout of Rathmines. Now, the second saltation, as it were, of Rathmines, its third incarnation, had less to do with water. Uh, as the Swan and its tributaries were being cul culverted by then, and more to do with a burgeoning sense of civic pride. The purchase of a residential house on Rathmines Road Lower, for use as offices and modest town hall, led it to the remarkable development over half a century and more of a cluster of billion, uh, buildings devoted to local services and various civic functions. I've marked that uh, on the uh, early map here. Um, you can see in red, the top, late 19th century, early 20th century, uh, focus, if you like, of Rathmines. And they're developed here, as I say, a number of local services and civic functions. They consisted of a magnificent town hall, uh, the structure that has been described as a truck with a building attached to it containing a warrant of offices and two public concert halls, a fire station, technical college, public library, service yards, refuse to structure, electricity generating plant, morgue and artisans dwellings, all within a stone's throw of each other. There's a map uh, depicting uh, in pink the various um, civic um, buildings that were associated with this uh, quite remarkable uh, civic um, nucleus. There are some of the buildings, the very well-known town hall, and opposite the town hall, the public library. Now, the body which gave rise to this assemblage and spearheaded suburban development was the board of the Rathmines Imp Improvement Commissioners, or Rathmines Township Board, set up by private act of parliament in 1847. This board was dominated by speculative builders, epitomised by Frederick Stokes, whose energetic zeal in promoting the township largely led to its foundation. He would be the chairman of the board for many decades. Builders such as Stokes were responsible for the erection of at first large detached villas set in their own grounds. And later, as the taste for suburban living moved down the social scale, semi-detached houses, terraces, and whole squares throughout much of the 19th century. By the late 1830s, Rathmines Road Lower was lined on its entire east side by terraces of large houses from Rathmines Village to Portobello Bridge. This was greatly facilitated by the straightening of the old winding riverside Lower Rathmines Road, which was, car was carried out in the summer of 1800. This ribbon development was also seen on the other arterial routes to the city, which run parallel to Rathmines Road, such as Mount Pleasant Avenue, which was never straightened or widened and retains the sinuous character of an ancient path. Indeed, it was known as the path to Milltown well into the 19th century. The continuation of Mount Pleasant Avenue, Palmerston Road, was the last area of the township to see major development. The other parallel arterial routes were the equally ancient Paris Cross Road and Remela Road. This is Roke's map of 1760, 
and we see there are these various arterial routes uh, running through a very rural area. Um, Rathmines Road is the uh, is is marked there as as uh, Rathmines Path. The presence of a large number of builders on the township board allowed for the seamless creation of new roads necessary to open greenfield sites and former agricultural ground for housing. The ribbon development along the main north-south routes to the city was followed by the cutting of crossroads linking these arteries, such as Leinster Road, Richmond Hill, alongside the River Swan, as we have seen, and Castlewood Avenue. The main developer of Leinster Road was none other than Frederick Stokes. A process of infilling followed, with minor roads off these being created. The timing of the suburbanisation of Rathmines can be tracked by the frequency with which the recording of land transactions relating to the area appear in the records of the Registry of Deeds. Before 1800, Rathmines crops up infrequently. But there is a huge sur surge in land transactions from the first decade of the 19th, 19th century, continuing into the 1820s and 1830s. Many villa owners began selling off whole fields. William Bernard of Williams Park, a large house in Lower Rathmines Road, put two acres of meadow on the market between Rathmines Road and Mount Pleasant Avenue in 1817. Grimwoods, a large nursery at the junction of Rathmines Road and Rathgar Road, sold off for house building the greater part of their nursery land fronting the road. As a result, selling off thousands of oak, elm, ash, birch and fruit trees. A number of notable speculative builders and developers were associated with particular areas. These were William Bernard, Williams Park, John Butler, Leinster Square, Frederick Jackson and Frederick Stokes, the Leinster Road area, John Holmes, Homeville and Castlewood Avenue, Michael Murphy, Kenilworth Square and Patrick Plunkett, Belgrave and Palmerston Roads. A major step in the completion of a middle class enclave was taken in 1867 when the township commissioners ordered that all the remaining thatched cabins and wooden sheds in the township were to be removed and notice given to their owners. With its proliferation of squares and fine roads, in 1869, the Irish builder referred to Rathmines as the Dublin Belgravia. And by 1900, much of the green fields of Rathmines had been gobbled up. There is a map from Tom's directory of 1898, and you can see how built up the area has become. Originally, there appears to have been little or no opposition to this process of suburbanisation, and the private act setting up the township sailed to Parliament. Vested interests in the shape of large landed estates uh, did exist. However, their owners were absentees and seemed to acquiesce in the suburban process. They were the Earl of Mead, uh, the Mead estate in Lower Rathmines, and the Palmerston estate in Upper. By the time of the formation of the township, much of the mead land had been leased on long leases to various interests. The Palmerston estate, more remote from the city, less so. However, the lure of easy money available for satisfying uh, the craze for middle-class suburban living was difficult to resist, especially in a family such as the Palmerstons, striving to fund an extensive lifestyle and high political ambition in England. Opposition to massive development in the form of an indigenous population seeing little in it for them, the humble inhabitants of the aforementioned thatched cabins, doomed by decree of the township board, for instance, never really materialized in that mines. Such opposition had been seen in the formation of the Black Rock Township, for example, among the inhabitants of the Williamstown village area. Rathmines pre suburbanization was sparsely populated. The village of Rathmines on the banks of the Swan, the junction of the Rathmines Road and Rathgar Road was tiny and may not have been of long standing. 
Some voices of protest were, ra were raised later on on the Palmerston estate by tenants holding Conacre, with the agent recommended selling off the land for a villa building if opposition persisted. By the latter half of the 19th century, the ominous signs of a different kind of development were seen. The creation of what Samuel Lewis in 1837 called a business or retail village had already taken place in the chains area. The erection of shops in the front gardens of the big, big terraced houses on Rathmines Road Lower went hand in hand with change from single family residence to multiple occupancy. This eventually saw the creation of the famous or infamous flatland of 20th and 21st century rat mines, inhabited by civil servants, office workers and students from the country, and latterly immigrants from all over the world, giving the area a distinct cosmopolitan feel. The 68 bus route from Clondalkin to the city centre goes right through the heart of Vinci Corn and Kilmainham. On crossing over the canal, the scene from the top window was the spires of Diablos Church and the red brick terraced houses come into view. It's difficult to reconcile with the images conjured up from historical sources of mill wheels, flowing streams and winding boreens. And it makes you wonder about suburbanisation. Where did it all begin? I hope this talk will go some way towards answering this for the Inchicore and Kilmainham neighbourhood. At the opening of the 19th century, the district we know today as Kilmainham and Inchicore was rustic and rural, comprising the villages of Kilmainham and Island Bridge and the smaller hamlets of Golden Bridge and Inchicore, all enclosed between and along the banks of the rivers Liffey and Camac. From the evidence of early Orton survey maps, Apart from two mills at Kilmainham and one each at Golden Bridge and Island Bridge, along with a large print works, there were few other significant industrial concerns in the region down to 1843. Most of the surrounding land was in farmsteads and contained no country seats. Inchicore House and Golden Bridge House were probably the two most substantial residences in the district. Over the course of the 19th century, significant institutional and industrial presence saw the region grow in population and importance. So much so that by 1867, it was deemed necessary to amalgamate the villages and their corresponding townlands <clears throat> into the new Kilmainham Township. What I'm going to do here is outline four important shifts that enabled suburbanization and led to the transformation of this locality from a pastoral village setting at the beginning of the 19th century to a busy urban township by the end. Kilmainham was a village with a long and rich history behind it by 1800. It had been a place of great ecclesiastical and political importance, the site of a monastery, then later a priory of the Knights of St John of Jerusalem, before the Royal Hospital took their place. The priory and manor of Kilmainham had been home to government officials and dignitaries through the centuries, and some clues of a prestigious past were still evident as the 19th century approached. It was still the seat of the County Dublin Grand Jury and therefore held the County Jail and Sessions House. This placed it uniquely for interactions between town and country folk on important occasions such as election days and Grand Jury meetings. Nathaniel Burton, in his History of the Royal Hospital Kilmainham of 1843, paints a colourful picture. I quote, Imagine, if you will, the rosy squire from the foot of the mountains, his Dublin made blue coat and gilt buttons, appearing from beneath his outside of saggard frieze, hands in great coat pockets and horsewhip sprouting therefrom, talking to some would be member of parliament or goose quill from Chancery Lane, whose figure would not harmonise with rural landscape." Unquote. Kilmainham was also placed geographically between town and country. Compared to the neighbouring city to its east, it could not hold any pretensions of being a significant town, yet it was clearly more substantial than its neighbouring villages and hamlets to the west. Its people appeared old fashioned and tended more towards the country than the city. Again, Burton gives us a tantalising glimpse of the aged female in the street, and I quote, 
with snowy kerchief on her head, enveloped in grey cloak, hobbling along, but seldom beyond the precincts of Kilmainham or Bow Bridge on that side, yet conversant with the Boreens of Inish Nakora, Ballyfermot and Ballinagaddy towards the other, to gather in her antique basket the new laid eggs for the fogies of the old house. And the fogies of the old house being the old soldiers of the Royal Hospital. But more important here is the interaction of the locals with the city to one side and the rustic countryside to the other. In this way, Kilmaina might be interpreted almost as a stepping stone between urban and rural. <coughs> Excuse me. In Ishnikara, the place name mentioned, refers of course to Inchicor, describing the land situated between the rivers Liffey and Kamak, Inish being an island. Some sources say island of sheep, others island of berries, but what we do know is that this was once woodland and supplied the priority to which it belonged with fuel. The first marker of significant change in the locality was the building of the new county jail on elevated ground in 1796 to replace the old one situated on low damp ground in the old village of Kilmainham. The site chosen was Gallows Hill where public executions had once taken place and the land was provided by Lord Cloncurry, the main landlord of the area. Some cottages already standing west of the jail were later used to house prison staff. When in 1820 Kilmainham Courthouse was built next to the jail as the new Sessions House for the County Dublin Grand Jury, the new site was now also elevated in status and became an important public space for the type of gatherings described by Burton. From this point on, development on the western side of the circular road was associated with improvement and became known as New Kilmainham while the term Old Kilmainham was reserved for the original low-lying village to the east or city side. At this early stage of the 19th century, the mills on the Kamak and Liffey were the big employers in the area. In 1787, Bart Sullivan built his paper mills on the Kamak at Golden Bridge. In 1786, Mr. Henry's Calico Works were opened on, on the Liffey at Island Bridge. And then in 1812, Messrs. Willans opened their Hibernian woolen mills on the Kamak at Kilmainham, employing 277 persons, one third of whom are English skilled workers. And this figure then increased to over 500 by 1837, and they also built houses for their workers. So making a significant contribution to the local economy as well. And then there's Manders flour mills, also at Island Bridge on the Lithian, also employing over 500 workers by 1837. It would appear that down to 1840 or so, the population of the district were in place to service the needs of local industry. And with the mill owners recruiting workforces from outside the immediate locality, including England and Dublin City, we are seeing the first signs of suburbanization at this early part of the century, especially with the building of houses for workers. Another big change also occurred early in the century, and that was the opening of the Richmond Barracks in 1814. With the exception of the paper mills of Golden Bridge, development south of the Kamek had been limited to a few cottages along Emmet and Tyrconnell roads, known then as the Highway to Nace. Land here was a mixture of arable and pasture, and was described by Burton as late as 1843 as, and I quote, an ordinary potato country with crooked pear tree orchards and farmhouses of Queen Anne's day." Unquote. All the more dramatic then, the impact the new barracks must have made occupying a 14 acre site in this tranquil setting. Accommodating up to 2000 soldiers and their wives, they utterly transformed the townland of Golden Bridge North, whose population as late as 1841 was only 201 people in 37 houses. With a large number of English workers already in the mills, the district was taking on a strong Protestant orientation, which would be an important factor in later years when the Oblate Fathers arrive. During the construction of the barracks, a spa had been discovered while quarrying for stone at nearby Golden Bridge, and the village rose briefly to prominence as the Richmond Spa opened to visitors. However, it was a short-lived glory as the proximity of the barracks would have a detrimental effect on the unspoiled village setting of Golden Bridge. By 1835, there were 11 vintners, two tobacconists, seven boot and shoemakers, seven grocers, 11 provisions dealers, 
a bonnet maker, a hosier and a billiard room keeper, all compacted into this one green river valley. The majority of these small businesses catering for the soldiers and their families. I've mentioned already the first phase of industrial development with the mills, but perhaps the most important impetus for the transition from rural to urban was the opening in 1846 of the Great Southern and Western Railways Engineering Works at Inchicore. This large site on land purchased by the railway company, again from Lord Cloncurry, had a huge impact on the area, not least of which was the development of a village centre for the townland of Inchicore. The original Inchicore settlement shown in Taylor's 1816 map was not depicted by the Orden survey in 1843, and the building of the railway houses at the Inchicore Square development was the beginning of the modern village. In 1841, the townland of Inchicore South contained 199 people living in 31 houses. By 1851, this had risen to 656 people in 96 houses, and by 1861, 784 people in 109 houses, all built by the railway company. With a workforce of 1,200 by 1868, most recruited from outside the district, including skilled workers from England, like the mills, the railway company provided an even greater catalyst for suburbanization, and its presence intensified the working class character of the neighborhood. The next and final important shift in the development of the district before the formation of the township was the arrival of the Oblate Fathers to Inchicore in 1856. With large numbers of English employed locally, in addition to the military presence, the area was well served for Protestant places of worship. Upon the arrival of the Oblates, there were two meeting houses, two Methodist chapels, the Barrack Church, and then in 1862, St. Jude's Parish and Church was established too. For Catholics, there was only one small church in the Golden Bridge Cemetery used only for funerals. The main purpose of the Oblate Mission in Inchicore was to minister to the spiritual needs of the Catholic workers, but they did so much more by helping establish Catholic clubs and campaigning for better housing for the working classes. <coughs> By the early 1860s, the morphology of the region had changed considerably from the earlier years of the century, but public services were poor and blame was directed towards the local grand jury. Issues highlighted were roads in a scandalous state of repair, public lighting non-existent, no running water, and cases of fever in the district, owing to an open sewer from Richmond Barracks flowing directly into the Kamak. Some local businessmen, including David McBurney, Francis Moore Scott, Samuel Shelley and John Summers, all woolen drapers and mill owners, got together to promote a new bill for establishing a township under the 1854 Town Improvement Act. The promoters claimed, with unashamed bias, that nowhere in the county of Dublin was land better suited for the, for the build, building purposes than in Kilmaine of an inch of core. And they argued that if proposed improvements to utilities were enacted, the salubriousness of the area would improve and wealthy inhabitants induced to move in. McBurney, a property owner in Rathmines as well as Kilmaine, believed that the same would happen in Kilmaine as Rathmines if the bill passed. The only opposition came from the railway company, fearing new rates would be too costly, but once the bill passed, they also got on board. By 1880, the township was connected to the city's Bartley water system and all its main streets lit by gas lamps. The sewage issue at the barracks was also resolved in 1887. This was reflected in the valuation that had risen from £6,243 in 1868 to 8,911 by 1880, and the population from 4,956 in 1871 to around 6,000 by 1880. Over the years, the composition of the boards changed as the Catholic community found a voice through institutions like the Inchicore Catholic Club and the Ratepayers Association and began to nominate their own members to the township board. Related to this was the formation of the Kilmainham House League in the mid 1880s. This was an urban version of the Land League, and the Kilmainham branch was the only one formed in Dublin city and county, thus reflecting the militant working class character of the locality by the end of the century. 
In 1900, the township was annexed into the municipal district along with Drumcondra and Clontarf. Although it had not become another Rathmines or Pembroke, as at first hoped, it was content with being Kilmainham, defined by its industrial working class character. For the third and final suburb that we're looking at today, we're going to head north of the River Liffey uh, along the Great North Road to what is now the suburb of Drumcondra. This very early map from the Down survey uh, shows us some clues as to the topography and basic characteristics of the area. If we head north from uh, Dublin, uh, one of the first major features that we encounter is the River Talca and just to its north we have this area named Clonturk. It's the civil parish, it's often translated as uh, the meadow of the Talca. Um, so this would be a meadow or a floodplain uh, associated with the river. We also see a little place name here, Drishok, which comes from the Irish word for bramble, so perhaps not the most agriculturally attractive area, and this is also a town land name. Drumcondra itself, of course, refers to the ridge, the rising ground to the north of the river. Uh, one name that's not mentioned here, but I'll, I'll, I'll include it just for uh, completeness, is Clonliff, which we will also encounter later. And Clonliff or Clunliffa refers to the meadow of the Liffey. So the uh, land uh, to the east of the Great North Road between the Liffey and the River Talca. Uh, this area had a strong association with Dublin, with the town. So the country area and the town were closely linked from the 12th century because several monastic houses actually owned land in this area, including All Hallows uh, Priory, um, St. Mary's Abbey and um, the uh, Christchurch Cathedral. And indeed there was a grange at Clonliffe which included farm buildings and a mill on the Talca. After the dissolution of the monasteries, uh, various uh, entrepreneurs uh, acquired land in the area. Among them was James Bath, whose son John built Drumcondra Castle, the first major dwelling in the area. And the Bath family had a lot of lands, various barns, storehouses, thatched cottages and so on. They also had a brick house in Drishog um, and a stone house in Clonturk. Uh, we don't know much about the more humble residents. They probably were living in uh, thatched uh, cabins which melted back into the landscape. But this is very much the same scene that we still see in Rogue's map from the 1760, with a predominantly rural landscape here. We're coming out from Dublin along the North Road over the bridge. Uh, there's mill here, the Drumcondra manufactory, um, and we have an area of, area of fields, as studded with these bigger houses in their parkland. Um, and if we close, look close in, I've just marked some of these major buildings uh, that we see later on. Now, Rogstrom Condra is clearly north of the River Talca, but the name seems to shift a little bit over time and come closer to the city boundaries. And that's particularly the case once the Royal Canal is built. So here in Taylor's 1816 map, we can see uh, the Royal Canal is in place and uh, just to the north up here, uh, we will see uh, the name Drumcondra now clearly well south of the River Talca. So the name is slightly uh, moving. The new barrier between uh, the city and uh, the, the county area uh, the Drumcondra area means that this newly developing area um, is, is increasingly known as Drumcondra and uh, becomes the southern boundary, in fact, of Drumcondra. Moving in a little bit closer, uh, we can see uh, the Turnpike, which seems to have uh, reduced uh, development, at least for some time, the existence of toll roads, never very popular and a series of mills along the river still. And we can see some of this ribbon development coming out from Dublin, as well as uh, Clonliffe uh, Road 
which has been uh, renamed from its previous Fortix Lane. Now, don't let uh, the river uh, uh, depicted here deceive you, uh, because it is far less benign uh, in uh, many cases, as uh, we know with flooding. And indeed, Lewis in 1837 uh, tells us that the woolen mill on the river had recently been washed away in floods and subsequently rebuilt. That's presumably the same manufactory that we see in Rook. Um, also, Lewis tells us about the the, the development of a sort of cluster of activities uh, in Drumcondra. Uh, there was now a parochial school and an asylum for poor women. Um, later on, there was also going to be a courthouse and a police barracks in the area too. Um, by the middle of the century, we start to see some suburban type development. There are new terraces of housing being constructed. The city is starting to spill over the canal. And this is what we see if you just look at this square here between the first edition ordnance survey and the transformation uh, in the space of little over 30 years. So there's still uh, plenty of building ground, but there has been considerable development. Meanwhile, uh, the pattern of acquisition of some of the larger houses in the vicinity for institutional use had begun. Um, I'm not going to list them at all out, but between the early 1840s and the 1870s, there was a considerable change in use. Um, one of the things I've noted here is that a lot of these large campuses uh, still had a semi-agricultural feel to them. Uh, there's cattle here in front of Clonliffe College and in St. Patrick's College, uh, the farm survived until much later indeed, into the 20th century. Um, also of note, although it was never actually constructed, is the proposal to build a university here at Clonliffe West. Uh, this is one of uh, Cullen's uh, plans from 1862, which didn't come to fruition and instead uh, the enclosed order, the Rodentoristines took the site. So all of this was going on leading up to the 1870s, uh, by which time we start to see uh, rumblings about the possibility of developing a township. Um, so this starts to gain momentum, it becomes all the more enticing because the new Drumcondra tramway uh, is, is, is uh, finally completed in 1875. And that opens up the area and makes it even more attractive to developers. There were some thoughts as to whether it should join with, uh, with Clontarf or be an independent township. Um, one of its promoters was James Fitzgerald Lombard, a prominent businessman, a director of Arnott's, and importantly for Drumcondra, soon to become uh, the chairman of the newly formed Dublin United Tramways uh, Company. Uh, so he could ensure that the trams would serve uh, Drumcondra very well. He'd already been developing on the South Circular Road uh, with um, Arnott, and in the 70s he had acquired land along with Edward McMahon from the Blessington and Mount Joy estate, um, which, some of which stretched into Drumcondra. So he had built hundreds of terraced houses and was anxious to promote Drumcondra as a place to build more. Not everybody favoured the proposed township. The response was somewhat similar uh, to uh, in Clontarf, where initially some landowners uh, tried it to retard its development. A meeting of ratepayers in Glasnevin was held to oppose the bill on the grounds that the pastoral districts of Glasnevin would be locally taxed for the purpose of improving Drumcondra. But the promoters won the day and the Act of Parliament was passed in 1878, with Lombard becoming the first chairman of the commissioners. Uh, so he brought about improvements in street lighting, a new very badly needed sewage scheme, um, but also ensured that Drumcondra was well served by the city trams. Now we've seen that the early establishment of Rathmines Township helped to cement its particular character. While Kilmainham's early township commissioners aspired somewhat unrealistically, uh, to become another Rathmines. But as the last township to be established, the township of Drumcondra, Clonliffe and Glasnevin could never hope to compete with uh, the likes of Rathmines. So from the outset, 
it targeted a different demographic. So its market was generally the lower middle classes, the clerical uh, and also the skilled artisans. Um, and the style of housing matched this profile. But the nature of the development process, uh, which was quite piecemeal, uh, meant that the built environment is quite diverse within what at first glance might appear to be red brick uniformity. So the township commissioners uh, gave a rates remission on houses valued at £12 or less to encourage house building and the settling of these fairly well to do artisans. And within a few uh, short years, over 200 houses had already been built under the scheme. The main beneficiaries, including some of the local commissioners like Mr Butler, Butterley from Home Farm, whose houses let as fast as they could be built, and Edward McMahon. So uh, this is McMahon uh, explaining how the development process uh, operated. Um, despite the general focus on this particular target market, some prime locations were developed uh, with housing of higher specifications and valuations as along Drumcondra Road itself. There was also diversity in terms of the timing of uh, development, sort of successive waves of suburbanisation. So if we travel here to Clonliff Road, we can see this in action. Um, because the earliest developments on the north side of the road uh, were large houses uh, with carriage, uh, carriages and, and mews to the rear, um, uh, offering, as the advertisement said, all the advantages of town and country residents. And you can see the scale of the dwellings and, and the large sites very much in contrast with uh, the, the so-called villas across the road, which represent the next phase of development. Um, and these later houses, although still uh, quite good quality uh, and highly respectable, uh, were marketed as superior suburban homes of a class for which a strong demand exists in this neighbourhood. And meanwhile, uh, the side roads and the areas in behind the main streets uh, were clearly aimed at working class housing. And indeed, uh, it, the uh, township more or less congratulated itself that it was saving people from the wretched tenements by building these houses, uh, not directly, of course. Um, so this is what uh, completed Clonliffe Road looks like. And the bigger houses are on this side, on the north side of the road. And these are the later uh, so-called villas. Uh, of course, there were places of worship uh, to accommodate uh, the new residents. Uh, I won't go into that now. Um, but despite its aspirations and the fact that it achieved some success in terms of paving, lighting and other services, the Drumcondra Township was still viewed with some disdain by others in more established areas. Um, so a property holder in Rathmines could write disparagingly to the editor of the Irish Times, mocking, and I quote, the chairman, Mr Butterley, and the commissioners of Drumcondra Township. Uh, I considered what, the, what gallant little Wales was in relation to England and Ireland. Such was Drumcondra to the other townships of Dublin. And not only do they seem solicitous of their own peculiar interests, but they contemplate conferring large advantages upon the whole country, which other townships of much bigger pretensions and much greater resources have failed to carry out in the past. Certainly by the time that the township ceased to exist, it apparently had little to show for its efforts. Unlike Rathmines with its impressive civic centre, Drumcondra didn't have a physical legacy in the form of a town hall or other significant buildings. At the last premises it had used as a temporary town hall had been demolished to make way for the railway that we see in the back of this picture. But its physical legacy is in the distinctive range of houses which was built, which lend the area distinctive character. Despite the demise of its independent existence in 1900, Drumcondra's development momentum was well underway and the census shows us that house numbers and overall population continued to grow right up until the First World War ceased, stopped construction. Uh, following a hiatus, the late 20s would see a dramatic change 
when Dublin, Dublin Corporation developed a new housing scheme and associated routeway at Griffith Avenue in the northern part of Drumcondra. By 1928, an Irish Times article could speak about a brand new town on the slopes near Mar Marlborough Hall. Fields had become streets. Almost it seemed as if this spick and span town had come out of a fairy tale in the passing of a night. And it describes the suburban development process where it was rather curious to see haymaking going on in one of the few surviving fields surrounded by half finished houses and all the paraphernalia of building the country fighting a rearguard action against the march of the city. This represented yet another wave of the same processes which had been underway throughout the previous century, not just in Drumcondra, but across all of the suburbs we have spoken about today. The suburbs in the 20th century are a story for another day, but already, as we have seen, the relationship between town and country had been irrevocably changed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ruth. And uh, we have lots of questions coming in and we will go back to the speakers in just a few moments, just to remind you that to use the Q&A panel if you'd like to insert your question there. And uh, Paul says, I have Clontarf and it's magnificent. Thank you very much. Uh, and Colm, we might come back to you uh, after some of the questions, if, if you wouldn't mind just to come back to that theme of, of commonalities and diversities and you might like to, to draw some points out having listened uh, to, to the papers. So just to, to flag that to you, um, you can maybe have a little think about that uh, while the others are, are dealing with the questions that are coming in. And obviously uh, the questions are coming in in, in order. So we had uh, Seamus first on Rathmines. Uh, so Seamus, we'll um, go to, your, to yourself and I think this was Audrey's question. What happened to the inhabitants of the huts and thatch, thatched houses which were removed? Dublin evictions? Seamus? Possibly, I mean, um, like the poor in general, they really don't enter into the historical record. Um, now, eventually, the but it was late uh, 19th century, early 20th century, the township did build, first of all, uh, artisans' dwellings. Uh, for instance, uh, a little housing estate of small cottages beside the town hall, largely um, uh, were taken up by workers who worked for the township, including my own grandfather, who was a fireman. Uh, but also, they also built what were known as uh, labourers' dwellings. These were blocks of flats. Uh, there was one in Mount Pleasant Avenue, and there was up another up in a place called Hollyfield in Upper Rathmines. But the, as far as the early, uh, say from the 1850s, 1860s, those who were, in, in a way, I suppose, displaced, uh, it, it just no, they don't enter the record. But certainly later, the, the township began to build under pressure from legislation really in Great Britain as it was then uh, in general, it, it, they were forced to um, begin to uh, build artisans' dwellings and labourers' dwellings. Okay, thank you Seamus. And uh, Frank, we may go to, to you for this one, please. Um, Paul says, interesting that both Rathmines and Kelmena Minich Corps both had barracks. Any particular comments on, on that? Yeah, um, it's the, the, I'm not sure like any, any sort of relationship between the fact that Rathmines and Kamenham had the barracks. Uh, there was the, the Barracks and Island Bridge that were, were built in, in 1798 and, you know, after the emergency of the, the 1798 rebellion. Uh, it was obviously uh, deemed a good idea to, to shore up the fences. So the barracks in Nyland Bridge were built and then by 1807 they're talking about building the barracks in, in the Richmond barracks in Inchicore and uh, work begins on them in 1810 and they're opened in 1814. Uh, and it seems like the barracks, apart from the, from, apart from the Royal Barracks, obviously, you know, the, um, down on, on the quays there, uh, Collins Barracks, Apart from them, I don't think I can't think of any other barracks in the north side. Uh, maybe Aldborough House, um, but uh, so it seems to have been yeah, like the Richmonds were down along the canal, and then there was Beggars Bush also, you know, close to the canal as well on the south side. But why uh, 
you know who all why why Injacor was picked was chosen for Richmond Barracks. Like I'm not 100 sure. You know the land was available. <laughs> Uh, Thanks, Frank. And uh, Seamus, would you like to, to to add anything there in terms of the barracks? And yeah, well, I mean, certainly Lower Athmines, the area between Lower Athmines Road and Harrow's Cross was dominated by Portobello Barracks, which of course is still there. But it, it seems to have much uh, interrelationship with the area, with the township in particular. Um, I mean, uh, we have extensive uh, full records of the minutes of the Rathmines Township uh, from beginning to end, 1847 to 1930. And the barracks hardly ever gets a mention in those um, records, apart from the um, township wanting to uh, rate for you know, rate the houses that were lived in by the by the um, by the um, the authorities associated with the barracks, but apart from that, the barracks doesn't seem to have greatly influenced the area in general. It's kind of self-contained unit. It was originally a cavalry barracks, so it may have been might have been a little bit upper class originally. Um, but it it uh, it's strange that there's a kind of a silence relating to it, and it seems to have been very much a self-contained unit. Thanks, Seamus. Um, and Bruce, we'll, we'll move on to yourself now. A uh, couple of questions coming in. The first is from Paul. Could Ruth say a word about the relationship between Drumcondra and Last Nevin? That's the first one, Ruth. And the other question is from Brendan Teeling for yourself. Were lands at Drumcondra owned at some point, medieval period, by the corporation? I think the city's coat of arms are on the wall in the church. Uh, so going to their roots. So first of all, Drumcondra and Blasnevin, the relationship, and then um, uh, the, the lands of uh, Drumcondra and the relationship to the corporation. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, so in relation to uh, Drumcondra versus uh, Glasnevin, uh, Glasnevin sort of remained aloof a little bit from the whole process of becoming a township. It was more rural and had retained a sort of a more um, a, a different kind of a character. Um, so a lot of the residents were not too pleased, as I mentioned, at that prospect of becoming part, part of this township. But of course, over time, you see what side your bread is buttered on. So some of them got in on the act and, and became developers. But really, um, when you look at the maps, what you see is that apart from some ribbon de development along the roads, um, a lot of glass and Evan is actually being built somewhat later um, and it's post township that we see uh, that, that development occurring. Um, so and yes, Brandon is absolutely right. Um, after the dissolution of the monasteries, a lot of the land around Rumcondra uh, came under the ownership of the corporation who then leased it on to others. And in fact, I've come across mentions in corporation records even from the 20th century uh, in relation to leases for uh, the famous pub, the, the Cat and Cage, uh, which was on corporation land. Thanks, Ruth. And we might just stay with yourself. A question from uh, Willie Cummings. Were master plans prepared for the layout of the townships? Certainly not in the case of Drumcondra. I think of all the townships, possibly Pembroke, um, which was very heavily controlled by the Pembroke estate. Um, that they were a bit more systematic perhaps in, in what happened and, and a lot more controlling um, of the character of development. But um, I won't say that other townships were more uh, along the lines of get rich quick, but certainly they were eager to encourage development and perhaps less uh, careful in what was developed. And there were a lot of complaints in Drumcondra about the quality of, of construction. Uh, there, were, were, there was a case where houses were, were caused to be taken down because they were, well, they were about to fall down. Um, so uh, there was no such thing as a master plan, uh, certainly uh, for Drumcondra. It, and that's why it is quite haphazard. Uh, it's very piecemeal bit by bit. Uh, field by field. Thank you, Ruth. Seamus, do you want to, to come in there in terms of grand plans? No, not really. It very much, I think, like uh, Drumcondra. Um, I mean, the, the township uh, ha had little power, had very weak powers, really, in relation to overseeing development. It had certain powers. Um, so they, they never really drew up a master plan. I mean, the closest to it might be the development by one developer of squares like Grosvenor Square. Uh, and Kenilworth Square, 
And that's really about the biggest um, single block of development, I suppose, that's mastered in a way. Um, but nothing, uh, nothing um, that, 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 that deals with the township in, in general or as a whole. Uh, it's very much piecemeal uh, as well. And you can see that actually in the outline of the, the skyline in particular of the terraces, say along Rathlines Road. You know, you might have six houses of a particular height and then attached to those is another block, seven or eight houses, maybe a different height. T attached to that is another block lower or whatever. And it really that shows quite clearly in, in a way the development by one person in relation to the development of the next person by the next person, you know, and it's very much piecemeal like that. Uh, yeah. Very much similar to what Ruth was saying. OK, th thank you, Seamus. And, and, and just to say um, we did have over well over 200 um, uh, we have well over 200 attending today and, and there's still lots of you with us. So we will continue on um, with uh, with the questions if you're happy to stay with us and if the speakers are happy. We have a, a question now from Keith Lilly, really for all the speakers today. Um, and you may have seen this in the Q&A bar. It's, it's a long comment question. Excellent talks, he says, comparing across these examples of Dublin suburbs. Are there similar or different processes of residential development identifiable for the later 19th century? For example, in how a field or a paddock over time became a street with buildings. Are estates in the outer parts of Dublin developed in a coordinated way, led by landowners? Or is development more piecemeal, fragmented, field by field, with private builders and developers acquiring fields and open land with building speculatively for new residents? And is the morphological frame of fields, sorry, my phone just going there, um, and is the morphological frame of fields and lanes still imprinted in the later suburban landscape of streets and street blocks? Um, so uh, there's a lot in that, but I'm sure it's something um, that you can all say something a little about. Um, we might just go to Colm or Seamus first on this because um, um, Colm, you, would you like to say anything in terms of Clontarf? Yeah, um, thank you. Uh, if I could address perhaps um, Keith's uh, final uh, query there first about the morphological frame. I think uh, I found uh, in drawing up the topographical information gazetteer of places uh, and locations for Clontarf that there is uh, a great deal of continuity uh, in um, things like uh, names of lanes, fields, um, in the later landscape of uh, of the streets and, and street blocks. So I, I think that's something that's very, very interesting. And I, I think I sense that uh, from our, our other um, speakers uh, today. Um, as to the um, processes of re residential development, I, I haven't really seen much of a pattern over the uh, the suburbs that we, we've looked at already. I mean, um, we, we have, as Seamus uh, and, and I think the other speakers mentioned, uh, the idea of um, de development piecemeal in terms of, we say, terraces. And that's certainly visible and evident in Clontarf for places like St. Lawrence's Road, where uh, blocks of six houses uh, designed according to um, a similar pattern uh, would be uh, erected. And then uh, similarly, other blocks in a slightly different style. So, so there's, there's no real continuity or master plan or overview there very much. Um, and uh, as to the outer suburbs versus the inner suburbs, again, I get the impression that it varied from suburb to suburb, uh, you know, in, in, in places like Kingstown, Blackrock, um, Killiney and so on. Uh, they, they all had their, their different, um, uh, you know, groups of uh, developers and landlords. Uh, 
and and each interest seemed to have 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 its own um, objectives and its own ambitions. So one one of the things I think we'll be looking for from the suburb series uh, is um, a very good way of comparing uh, the uh, the townships across the county because we 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 know a little bit about it now, but I think the pattern uh, is is beginning to emerge and and will be uh, much more clear uh, in in uh, in in due course when we publish more of the uh, uh, suburban uh, townships in the series. Thank you, Colin. We might just give everyone a, a go at this one, if that's OK. So Seamus and then well, Frank and Ruth, please. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, there is a, a definite process to be seen in Rathmines morphologically, and I'm, I don't know about the other townships, in that you start off in Rathmines with these arterial routes in and out of the city, parallel to each other. You know, you have Harlow's Cross, in the west, then you have Rathmines Road, Mount Pleasant Avenue, Renola Road. And the suburbanisation is largely terraces along those uh, long roads in and out of the city, um, ribbon development. And then a number of develop developers take it in hand to link these by the, I mentioned it already, crossroads. It's very distinctive. It's, it's almost a definite pattern you can see happening. You know, Leinster Road links Harlow's Cross Road to Rathmines Road. Castlewood Avenue uh, links Rathmines Road to Renola Road. Um, Richmond Hill links Rathmines Road to uh, Mount Pleasant Avenue and they're running east-west. And then from those you have minor roads leading off those and as I said this process of infilling. Sometimes um, just roads and sometimes squares like Kenilworth Square and Bogner Square, Belgrave Square, although that's that's early, it kind of develops piecemeal um, and so on. So th there is that process that you can see happening. It's almost, a, 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 you know, um, a, a sequence, if you like, you know, um, arterial roads, cross roads and then infilling. I don't know whether it's exactly the same in other areas. Th thanks, Seamus. And, and Frank, you come in there. Yeah, um, I, I, I don't know of any sort of uh, major plan either, you know, and obviously, obviously the command and township records are all gone as well. So you're depending on uh, reports and newspapers and, and older maps. But um, the, the, the Inchicor, Kilmain, and the, you know, the whole area, it's based around the two roads, the highway to the west and then the road out to Inchicor too. So those two main roads um, and development in and around those roads, uh, it's really driven by the industrial presence and particularly the Great Southern, like when the Great Southern and Western Railway um, decides to build their Inchicore walks, you know, adjacent to their track, uh, that's what actually makes Inchicore, really. That's what that's what makes the uh, the, the village uh, spring up, you know, when the Inchicore um, square development is built there. And, uh, and then the mass of workers that come into the area, you know, to work in the Inchicore walks leads to uh, a need for the the, the Abla Fathers to come in, you know, uh, to build the Catholic church and schools and things like that. And so along Tear Connell Road and Emmet Road, then you see piecemeal development, but it's after these sort of two major um, uh, arrivals in the area. Uh, so it's, I, I suppose to, to summarise, I would say like the, the development in Inchicore and Kilmain and in the, uh, you know, the second half of the 19th century when the real suburbanisation uh, starts in all the townships, the development in Inchicore and Kilmain was really driven by the presence of the Inchicore Railway Works. Thank you, Frank. And, and Ruth, over, over to you maybe about these processes of residential development and then the, the morphological um, frame. Please. Yeah, so I, th I think very much as Seamus has described, you see the same processes at work in Drumcondra, where uh, the initial development is along the, those ancient routeways, and then the, the cross, the connecting roads come in later. Um, there's an example, one of the roads which joins um, Drumcondra and Glasnevin, the two main roads going outwards, um, begins at one end uh, where it's called St Alphonsus Road. It begins at the other end from the Glasnevin side where it's called, I think, initially Crawford Road. And then there's a piece in the middle which also is, is begun independently. 
um, as Iona Road and they're eventually joined up and we still have two different road names, two different street names in use there. Um, so again, yes, uh, I see somebody mentioning the individual terraces. If you look along uh, Clonliff Road, you'll see on the south side, I think there are 11 different individually named terraces and then the numbering system is introduced later on to try and you know integrate the whole lot. Uh, we also have one case in Drumcondra of uh, Jones's Road, uh, which is a very straight road, as you'll see, and it, it gave a direct connection to Buck Jones's house, uh, Clonliff House or the Red House, as it was known. And apparently his, his visitors were, were sick of having to go around along a, a narrow little country uh, road to get to uh, the main thoroughfare. So he, he arranged to have a road and a bridge built for them to get a more direct access back to town. Thank you very much, uh, Ruth. And just we're coming towards the end now and there's lots of people putting nice, interesting comments in the Q&A. So please, if you can look to that. Um, somebody asked any information on the building of the military barracks in Rathmines. Well, it was to say that the Rathmines Atlas will be coming out in the autumn. So you can keep, we've spoken a bit about the barracks. We might not come back to that, but the Rathmines Atlas will hopefully tell you something about that. Any work being done on villages like Clondalk and any planned? It's not on our list, Clondalk at the moment. And um, the suburbs we've just spoken are the ones we're dealing with at present. Um, uh, some other comments there, and we might just go to this one uh, from Laurie. Uh, was railway and canal development uh, used to clear slum areas or undesirable land uses in Drumcondra, or was this on undeveloped land, Ruth? Was railway and canal development used to clear slum areas or undesirable land uses in Drumcondra, or was this on undeveloped land? That's a really interesting question. Um, I don't know so much about the canal, but certainly the railway, um, the line that I showed you in, in the photograph where we have the independent bridge, where they actually demolished what had been used as a town hall, um, that comes very late in the day, um, in the 1890s. And um, there was actually um, mostly, most of the line is going along undeveloped land in that the square that I had I had shown previously, but when it cut across the road, um, they did actually completely uh, blot out uh, Burnett Road, and uh, there was a new uh, road uh, replacing it. But it didn't seem to be particularly um, uh, any particular type of of housing that was demolished. It was just whatever was in the way of the line. OK, uh, thank you very much, Ruth. Um, and uh, I, I think we might come wrap it up in terms of the, the questions um, for today. And before uh, some final words for myself, I might just hand back over to Colin, who, who, who set the scene for us at the very beginning, um, maybe just to draw some points together in terms of the commonalities and the diversities uh, that we've experienced today, really, across the suburbs. Colin. Thank you. Uh, yeah, no, it's been fascinating to see these uh, and uh, I, I just uh, ha have a few uh, very brief uh, uh, points. Uh, first of all, it, it struck me that all of the speakers in their um, review of their suburbs uh, concentrated very heavily on the location and the topography um, of, of the localities. And it's surprising and, and striking at the extent to which rivers uh, determined and dictated the development from the uh, previous period right into the 19th century. I think um, each of the uh, suburbs uh, had its own uh, indigenous uh, and existing population, which is important. There was kind of a critical mass there, uh, though it might have varied from Rathmines, which was perhaps more rural, to uh, Kilmainham, which had more of a working class uh, community from the later 18th century, and then um, uh, Ruth Strumcondra uh, was always uh, a very important um, uh, place for um, communication between city and, and, and county on, on, on major routes uh, northwards out of the city. Um, I think the role of the landlords has been stressed, uh, some of whom were um, very uh, development minded, others were uh, less so um, determined to preserve the character of their estates and 
uh, the amenities of, of their areas, whether beside the sea or, or inland. And one point, I suppose, that has been touched on too, which is important, is the uh, development of transport systems. And um, I'm just wondering um, about rail in all of this, not so much perhaps in these suburbs, which are inner suburbs, uh, but for the um, uh, the outer suburbs like Kingstown and uh, Black Rock and Mongstown and so on. I think the railway was important, but more important, I think, for the suburbs that we've been looking at was the the tramway and and the existence of uh, a lot of different lines uh, with uh, trams very frequently plying the routes, you know, between the city centre and 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 the suburban townships at at fairly cheap fares too. I think, uh, and that certainly was an encouragement to suburban uh, settlement. So overall, I think it's it's uh, it's just uh, very revealing of uh, the way in which all of these uh, village hubs um, in, in a way, I mean, the story is one of absorption within the municipality, but um, they've retained their village qualities. And I think this has uh, become evident more and more in recent decades, you know, where uh, the, the um, uh, particularly maybe in the last year or so, where the advice to stay local has meant that people have re rediscovered the kind of quality and, and uh, spirit of, of their local uh, their, their localities and their suburbs. Um, so uh, uh, that's that's all I, I, I have uh, I think to say at the moment, but thank you all. Thanks. Thank you, Colin. That seems like a positive note to end things on. And may I just say on behalf of all of us here uh, today, virtually here, sincere thanks to Ruth, Seamus, Frank and Colm for their work in preparing their paper uh, for today because it's been most enjoyable and stimulating for us all. Um, to remind you to keep up to date with IHTA news and, and, and work in progress via our website IHTA.ie and that's also how you access uh, the online atlases that we have accessible that way. Uh, this evening, of course, we at 7 p.m. we look forward to our plenary session with Professor Chris Dyer on medieval towns, why we need to take account of the country. And that session will be moderated by Professor Keith Lilly, who was with us there and asking questions uh, from Queen's University Belfast and chair of the British Historic Towns Atlas. And it will be introduced by the president of the Royal Irish Academy, Dr Mary Canning. So look forward to this evening, a uh, few hours to go, and I hope you'll join us again. And thank you all for joining us as a virtual audience today. See you later. <laughs>